Welcome back to the Go in the Match podcast. Today I'm joined by Jordan Russell of the Wolves Fancast. Jordan is a match going Wolves fan and has been following them for 23 years. Jordan, thanks for giving up your time today, mate, and thanks for coming on the podcast. No, no, thank you for having me, Mike. It's um, a pleasure to talk football with uh, like-minded individuals, mate. So anytime anyone asks me to speak about the Wolves, I'm more than happy to do so. Fantastic. Okay, so massive Wolves fan, season ticket holder. What was it that made you become a Wolves fan? Um, <clears throat> locality, I guess. I was pretty, uh, pretty fortunate that I was probably well. I was born in uh, New Cross Hospital, which is like two minutes away from the ground, and sort of always grown up and being, you know, well, grown up in Wolverhampton, really. Um, where my, when I, the house I grew up in, um, the house is probably around about ten minute walk to the ground um so it was just quite a natural sort of thing for me really to become a Wolves fan um there was a bit of a a bit of a battle when I was a kid because um my father's a massive Liverpool fan <laughs> and uh when I was born or so to say I was a member of like young Wolves and young Liverpool yeah. um so I had all the Liverpool kits and Wolves kits when I was you know growing up and stuff and uh it was the kit, the Wolves kit. I think it was 96. Um, and it's like the inverted Wolves head on the shirt. And okay. that was sort of like my favourite kit. And uh, I think I was, I'd have been about six then. And um, that was sort of my first memory of thinking, yeah, the, the, I'm going to pick Wolves now. Just because I like the kit more so than uh, more <laughs> so than the Liverpool one at the time. Um, so, yeah, that was sort of the decision with that. And, um, yeah, pretty much been going on and off since I've been, like say, six years old. I suppose having Molly and you like up up and around you live, you know, you're seeing it all the time and you know, when you're a kid you dream of playing forty and stuff. So, you know, it's very natural, isn't it? When you're in you like you say you're in the local area and you see the ground all the time and the fan base is around you, it's very natural. So what was the first match you went to and what do you remember about your first match day experience? So I went, um I was trying to find out the actual details. I'm pretty sure it was the ninety 90- 596 season um, and we played Sunderland at home and we drew one all and all I can remember is it was a, like a snowstorm like a complete blizzard and uh, I was sitting in the family enclosure freezing uh, about <laughs> four or five layers on and it was just freezing freezing cold so like the family enclosure at Molyneux is um, opposite the away end which, um, which you can see on the TV but the bottom deck as well so it's literally a carbon copy of that so five, six years old, just freezing. It wasn't the most sort of memorable game for me. Um, I sort of the first game I remember, I guess properly would have been sort of maybe the second or third time I went from speaking to my dad. I was just trying to work out what it was, but we played Portsmouth at home. Yeah. And um, I remember walking into the ground and that, like you see on videos now on on Twitter where they're capturing young kids. I actually remember sensing it, feeling it. And thinking it was a, uh, you know, just it just felt great sort of thing. And uh, the one takeaway from that game is I don't think I've got the uh, the Portsmouth bell ringer at my head still from that. All I can hear is that chime still <laughs> from the away end. Um, but sort of yeah, as soon as I went, started going to the games and getting into the ground. Like like I'm sure everyone who listens as well, it's sort of you get that sense, that feel. And as soon as you go once, it's like I suppose it's like a legal drug, isn't it? You just you just love it and you just want to yeah. go every week if you can. Yeah, every episode I've done, you know, with the fans and it's been like, you remember that moment going up the stairs, seeing the pitch for the first time. So, obviously, you were contemplating Liverpool Wolves. As soon as you went to that game, you knew it was Wolves for life then. That was yeah, it. yeah, and, you know, sort of with um, with um, Liverpool as well, you know, being from Wolverhampton and sort of, it's like a lot of ticket getting a ticket for Liverpool anyway. It wasn't till a bit later on that I actually went to and started going to Anfield with my dad when my dad started um, being a member in the cup scheme and stuff. Um, so yeah, sort of Molyneux was the first place I went to watch football, I guess. Um, and then sort of as soon as you do that, I think yeah, I think you're pretty set then anyway. So um, yeah, as a young kid, just loved to use used to love going. Getting the program was a big thing at that sort of age, and just sort of it was a day out sort of thing. So yeah, um, yeah as soon as you do that and start doing it, you you are, you are hooked from minute one, really. So when you went like the games you first remember, was it? Can you remember like going to the match thinking, oh, I can't wait to see him? You know, getting off your seat to see that one player or those two players. With you know, did you have a favourite player or I'm dead yeah. to see them today? <clears throat> so like 
so my sort of favourite player um, growing up, um, Robbie Keane for me. Oh, okay. So I was literally so. You're probably thinking with a Wolves fan, it'd be Steve Ball, Steve Ball, Steve Ball. And um, I was sort of, when I started going, Bully was at sort of the end of, end of his time. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, he's still a phenomenal goal scorer at that level. Um, but Robbie Keane, when I think he would have been 17 when I started, I think he made his day before us at 17. And um, he was the youngest player in the team. Um, and, you know, he just scored goals for fun at the championship level or the old Division One, should I say. Yeah. Um, and with that celebration with the cartwheel and the roly poly and all that, that, that's sort of what I started trying to imitate in the garden. So that was, I was just wanting to be Robbie Keane every time I played. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, ma- yeah, massive Robbie Keane fan. And um, unfortunately, we sold them to Coventry pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, most definitely for me, sort of growing up, my hero was Robbie Keane for a very short spell um, at that time. And, you know, it, it, any Wolves fan, you know, you've got to say Steve Bull as well, just for just a living legend, really, for all us fans. So what does a standard match day look like for yourself now? You know, I've never done Wolves away, so I don't know what's in and around the ground or... Um, so typically it'd be... If, um, it depends sort of obviously time and, you know, time and stuff. Obviously you get older. It, sometimes it's just dump your car, get in the ground. Um, so I've I've moved about a half hour away now um, with my partner. So um, yeah, I can't just walk up to the ground now, or walk to the pub and then go to the ground now. So it's a little bit harder for that. But typically, sort of um, going into the town centre for say say standard like sort of three o'clock kick off about midday. Um, you know, have a few beers around around the ground and then uh, um, in the pub. Sorry, and walk up to the ground and you know from the town centre you have to go through the subway which is quite well renowned as well. And um, as soon as you hit, if you're walking through the subway at say quarter to three on a match day, um, you've got it. You feel the intensity from as soon as you hit the, the subway steps, because it's about a two, three minute walk from the subway to the Molyneux to the South bank. And um, especially when it's a big game, you can feel it there. And then sort of the atmosphere is already going in the subway. It's all echoing and uh, that really gets you up for, up for the game really. So that's sort of, I guess sort of a standard, standard day really. It's all about going to football with your mates, having a few pints and enjoying it. And hopefully you get the three points. So have you got any pubs like in and around the ground? Because a few of the episodes I've touched on, you know, we've been a Liverpool fan myself and have an Anfield. There's so many pubs around I don't know why, but from such a young age, I always thought that every ground would have loads of pubs around it. But, you know, doing like, you know, I've done like Burnley and Newcastle, et cetera, West Brom, they haven't got those pubs. You know, they maybe have one away pub and then like maybe one home pub and that'll be it. Yeah, well, we've got in the town centre itself, um, I'll be honest with you, it's not very good for away fans because um, there's one pub literally by the train station um, for the away fans and literally the police will come and like sort of get you and escort you to the ground because yeah there's been incidents in the past like you know it, it's just for safety really not saying we're a horrible fan base but there has been you know it does boil over and you know whatever yeah. when alcohol is involved it can happen um, but sort of for home fans I mean in the town centre itself um, and like I say it's a five minute walk to the ground there's probably about 11 or 12 pubs you can go to so there's a wide variety for that typically what away fans do now um, just from speaking to away fans he's sort of Stay in Birmingham. Get you get into Birmingham New Street, and then stay in Birmingham. You can drink pretty much wherever there, um, and then it's a fifteen minute train from New Street to Wolverhampton train station, which is then sort of a seven minute walk to the Molyneux. So, yeah, the, in terms for away fans, it's probably not the best and a bit intimidating, which is probably mm. a bit on purpose as well. But uh, yeah, sort of there is a variety for home fans. For away fans, you, you're struggling a little bit, to be honest with you. So I believe you were a ball boy in the 4 5 season under Glenn Hoddle. So yeah. as a young fan, what was that experience like being so close to your heroes on the sidelines? It was well, yeah, it was it would just come about so strangely, really. So um there was a there's an advert in the local paper and um it was my mum who just said, Oh, the the reply they're doing like advertising for ball boys at wolves. And I was like, surely isn't a short list of this sort of thing. And um, we got so sent. He had to send in a, a it was um, a letter application as well. We didn't even email at that point. It was a letter still. Um, so sent in a letter, and the letter come back, and it was like, um, "Would you be invited to this ball boy day?" 
we were like, <laughs> right, okay. So literally, we went to um, Aldersley, which is like which was the old training ground at that point um, before the built on Compton, and um, went to the, went to this went to this went to Aldersley. It was like a, just a dome, and um, there's about twenty five people there, and they said, right, we're just going to play five aside. <laughs> right, right, okay. And literally, we played five side for two hours, and said, right, well, if you've been successful, we'll uh, we'll we'll get in touch with you on the phone. I was like, we haven't like I thought it'd be like sort of like again ball ball drills or whatever. Yeah, but yeah. literally, we played football and went home. <laughs> uh, and it was about two weeks later. Literally, when we didn't hear anything, I thought, I don't know what's going on here. Yeah. And um, we had a phone call saying, oh yeah, you know, he's he's been selected to be a ball boy. It was like, okay, brilliant. So um, literally went, um, first game was, first game was Sunderland at home and it was on Friday night, it was on Sky and um, went, you know, turned up at the ground, we got a tracky and all that sort of stuff, free and it was just like, oh, this is cracking, this is, I had our own swipe cards going to the ground, it was like, oh, this is brilliant. And um, as we were going round, they were like, right, walk around the pitch and um they're like, so where do you want, you know, where do everyone want to sit? So there's, I think there was about 12 of us and people were like, oh, I'll just sit here because it was nearest to the, to the entrance. I was like, right, okay. And I, I made a beeline straight away. I was like, there's no way I'm sitting in front of the away fans. Forget that. <laughs> Not a chance. Uh, and literally there was a space um, just to the right hand, just literally next to the home dugout. And Glenn Oddle just taken charge. And I was like, oh, I'll sit here. And like, yeah, that's fine. And that was our seat then for the whole season. So literally I was... 10 metres away from the Wolves Wolves dugout the whole season um, and yeah looking back on it now it's such a well yeah it, it was, thinking about it, how lucky to have been that close to the players and um, Glenn Oddle obviously didn't really work out for him as a Wolves manager but as an actual you know he's an icon as a player sort of you know my, my old man drummed into me you know he's what a man he was and um, sort of obviously I could remember him from 98 in the World Cup as well obviously being England manager I was just buzzing to be there yeah. and um, actually seeing, you, seeing those players up close personal even you know at times having conversations with some of the players and yeah it was um, yeah like to be a kid that young and being a die old, die old Wolves fan it was just yeah it can't, can't you know probably took it for granted at the time but I actually think about it, how lucky are you to be able to do that and say you've done it so yeah, it's buzzing with it. It's like a free season ticket, isn't it? <laughs> oh yeah, big time it was, and sort of. I mean, the football wasn't that good, but uh, it was the season after we got relegated from the Premier League the first time round. So we still had a few of the Premier League team there, but it was sort of a team in team in transition. Yeah, so yeah. It, it was okay, but yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it could have been better, I guess, in terms of that season for me as a ball ball. But actually, just being there and doing it, yeah, yeah. Fantastic to do. Brilliant. So now you've done your fair share of away days as well. Is there any that stand out for you? And, you know, have you got any stories behind any of them? Because I think, you know, going on the away days myself, the majority of the time it's not about the 90 minutes. It's no. about travelling to different places and, you know, the stories that come with it. So have you got any good ones for us? Um, yeah, so there was, I suppose, sort of some of the good ones were <clears throat> when I sort of just, just turned sort of 17, 18 sort of thing. So I was actually allowed to go away on my own then because, like I said, my dad wasn't my dad wasn't a Liverpool fan. My dad is a Liverpool fan. So we did a few away games where my dad would take me. Um, but that was just sort of like the local ones. Um, but then actually at that age then, started going with your mates and stuff, getting on the train. It's sort of, I'm right, here fan. we go. Yeah. Um, so the, the one that stands out for me in terms of, I guess, sort of as a performance... Um, was t- oh, 2000 and it was the season we've come back up to 2009 2010 season it would have been um, and we played Tottenham at White Hart Lane and um, we beat them 1-0 and literally so we've been on the beers in London we got down there early and we rocked up to the stadium just as kickoff happened okay. and you know we heard the, heard the whistle of or you just heard the referee's whistle and it was a free kick and sort of got to Started coming up the stairs at White Hart Lane in that corner you got. And uh, I was literally in the left-hand corner. Um, got up the stairs and was just standing on sort of like the gantry, just waiting to get to my seat because we had a free kick. And um, Kevin Doyle flicked on ahead and we scored. And literally I ended up 
gamboling sort of just as as always happens i end up down the bottom somehow like <laughs> battered and bruised sort of just people like just shaking me and all that sort of stuff it's like buddy hell what's going on here um <laughs> and um yeah that was such a surreal moment like you know sort of buddy are we actually going to win here <laughs> well you know at least we, well it wasn't we're going to win it's actually we scored a goal because we were pretty turgid back then yeah uh and um literally with the whole we, we end up winning one nil but we had our backs to the wall for 89 minutes but what was a sort of a funny story i guess from that was half time i'd gone to the i'd gone to uh i'd gone to the toilet um and you know people are singing dancing whatever in the toilet you know winding myself to myself wash yeah. my hands go back out sort of out to the exit and all of a sudden there's like just a massive pile on there's a big fight going on between walls fans i was like I had my trousers and buttoned up my trousers or I hadn't done my belt up. I was like, what's going on here? So I went ran, running over to find out what was going on. It was like two of my mates were get two of my mates been started on by I don't know what had happened, literally, just in the middle of it. Like and they ended up getting chucked out. <laughs> like my mate, yeah. two of my mates ended up getting chucked out and missed the second half. Um but literally it was just like, what has gone on here? Sort of thing. <laughs> it was absolutely mental. Um and that was like one of my first I suppose that was one of my first proper away days. So that's always sticks with me. Yeah. Um, and in terms of another one, which was quite, I suppose, another one that sticks out for me, just from sort of, a, I suppose, being a bit scared, if I'm honest with you, <laughs> a bit intimidated, was um, we played Birmingham the season before that. Um, it was a Monday night game. We were top, they were second, and we don't like each other at all. And yeah. sort of me growing up in my era, I'm tw- just turned 29 now, um, Albion is obviously the big rival to Wolves, but we, for a lot of that time, we've been yo-yo in between. The, we never seemed to hit meet. Yeah. Um, so Birmingham was always the one where we're in the Prem, they're in the Prem, championship, championship. Like We always seem to just have always that. Playing. So I really don't like them at all. And I don't know if you've been to St Andrews yourself. No. Um yeah, that that is a shithole. Like in terms of being a bit of a scary place as well. So, yeah, on the way back it was like say eight o'clock kick off and um, finished. We lost two nil, I think it was definitely lost anyway. And um, the police were just waiting for all the Wolves fans outside of St Andrews on the car park. So they literally got us in like this box of everyone that wants to go and get escorted back to New Street Station. So New Street was like a mile away. Um, and the police like, no, you've got to stay in this cordon. You're literally stuck, but you have to walk through Digbeth, which is um, basically the, the area between St Andrews and Birmingham City Centre, and it's just full of pubs, like home pubs and whatever. So literally, you walk in. There's about fifteen hundred of us walking down the middle of Digbeth, police escort, and then there's Blues fans just chucking whatever. Yeah. everything like coins flares yeah. bottles the lot and um thinking jesus like this like i was 18 i was literally proper it was felt i felt like a football factory genuinely yeah, and i don't go for the games for that at all um you know i want and i felt genuinely i was like shit me like this yeah. ain't good um and um the, there was a chap just in front of us like probably in his 60s bottle hit him on the head and cut his head open with a glass bottle and the throwing coins and stuff and uh, a walk which should take about 10 minutes took the best part of two hours wow just to get the police just it was just literally yeah it was it was horrible from that point of view it was just but that's another experience that sort of sticks with me yeah. um but i'm not sure about yourself in terms of you know the away games you've done and stuff and like of course you know i love going to anfield um and sort of like those old fashioned grounds but for me sort of my favorite um, ground or way day I've ever done is um, I really like Fulham. Oh, no, I don't okay. know if you've done it. No. Um, it's just a, a, I suppose, and again, it's got that weird sort of way end where you, it's like the neutral end, they call it. Yeah, and, um, that, yeah. Yeah, I've done it. I've done it three times now, and the f- one of the times we ended up in the neutral end just because we couldn't get a ticket in the away end, and um, yeah. we were literally on the far the, the way fans when you're looking at it on the telly are on the far right hand side so we were like far left and um we got in the ground and literally in front of us there was five americans with like brian mcbride tops on <laughs> that's how old i'm talking and they were just there like taking and i was like this isn't like and we'd obviously done the traditional get down to london early 
you know, you can get the you can get the ferry boat over to Fulham and all that sort of stuff. We've done all that, and you got there, and you're like, this is weird. Um, <laughs> but the other two times I've been, I've really, really enjoyed it. I think it's just because it's so old fashioned. It feels I don't know what it is. it's just very unique compared to other places. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I really like going to Craven Cottage, and um, yeah, it's sort of I'm I'm gutted really that probably aren't going to be able to do it this year with everything that's going on. But um, yeah, for me, it's definitely definitely up there as one of the best away games to do. Yeah, just thinking off the top of my head, now I can't think of another ground like Craven Cottage. You know, it's no, not it's weird. a similar one. So yeah, <clears throat> and even like even in the way in the seats like the wooden, and it, it just feels. I don't know what it is. You sort of get a feel for it, and I feel like, I don't know, whatever it is about it, like Burnley's wooden seats and stuff, but Burnley is horrible. Yeah. Whereas Fulham's, <laughs> I don't know whether it's just because it's Burnley and Chelsea, effectively. Yeah. <laughs> but like, yeah. it's Burnley, you just don't like it. Uh, Fulham, you quite like it. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, for me, so Fulham's sort of a top away day for me, and one I always like to do. So you're part of the award-winning Wolves fan cast, which was set up in 2007. How did that come about and how did you get involved in that? So, um, <clears throat> basically, I'd, I'd sort of spoken to the the founder who's now no longer with us, Dave. I'd sort of spoken to him about it via uh, for a few years, actually, because I'd, ju- I'd just been a fan listening to it. And uh, I'd won a competition through, like with them. And then it was just via DMs and all that sort of stuff, just talking, whatever. And then, like, it sort of went on for a long, long time, period of time. Um, someone I went to primary school with has been on there for a long time as well, who I knew, and I sort of name-dropped. But I hadn't spoken to him since I've been about probably 13, 14. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, w- one day, sort of just got a message on Twitter saying, um, we're a bit short tonight, do you fancy coming on? And mm-hmm. I was like, um, can do, sort of thing. Just went into it. I'm just a massive football, like Wolves fan first, but just football not. I love talking yeah. football. I love watching. I can watch anything, literally. Absolutely any football that's on the telly. My missus hates me for it, but I will watch absolutely anything. Yeah, it's nice. um, and talking football. So it's sort of, I've got an opinion on it. I've, I seem to have an opinion on it. And um, yeah, it's sort of, I thought, well, okay, yeah, we'll go on there and sort of f- filled in for a show and been on it ever since, really. So it's... Um, yeah, I just love, you know, sort of the the podcast that we do and the people we have on it. And it's just sort of a, it's sort of that hybrid from the official Wolves, black and white, be clean, this player was good, maybe this player couldn't be good. To actually, we're probably that, the fan voice in terms of, we're happy to say someone was fantastic, but if someone's not been good or... yeah. You know, get rid of him or yeah, you've got it, you know, and sort of people want people don't want sort of that fabricated truth of the the oh this is the politically correct way of putting it. Actually, like you've got to call out people for it. And I think that's why we do really you know, why we're quite successful with it, because um I got a bit of flack uh after the Sheffield United game this year, after lockdown, for being pretty harsh on on performances and Sort of just sort of our season, how it sort of stagnated come the end of it, and I think looking at it, you know, we were just naturally we, were just, we were knackered. That that's ultimately what it was. I think we were just knackered, run out of gas. Um, but actually putting it out there, you know, you're going to divide opinion where you know fans are going to say, well, actually we played this amount of games where we where we come from and stuff. But then you got a lot of fans saying actually it's a very small club mentality to still think that way. Oh yeah, we were in League One six seven years ago, but We've got new owners, new new manager. We've got multi-billionaire funds to be able to pump into the club. We're talking about winning the Premier League within 10 years and all that sort of stuff. So you've got to judge us on actually what we're about. You can't judge or compare Ruben Neves to George Savile because it's yeah. different teams, different eras sort of thing. So, um, yeah, sort of the podcast that we do, um, yeah, I, lo- I love being a part of it and just, you know, like I say, sort of love talking football, especially Wolves. Yeah, I think I think that's the thing that a lot of people, a lot of fans especially, do enjoy listening to the more the fan content now than rather than, than what's on Sky. You know, Sky do some great stuff, but it's more you feel more the passion and the harsh reality when you hear these fan channels of all different clubs and 
Yeah. So any listeners that haven't already gotten it, go and, go and give yourselves a listen to Wolves Fancast because doing some great stuff. Yeah, I appreciate it. But I think that's part of the reason there, Mike, why Arsenal Fan TV is so good in yeah. terms of that's why it's so widely renowned because it divert, you know, it, it really does divert sort of, you know, opinions of whether it's good or bad. But you know what? They, they get views, they've got con- great content, they've got all these, you know, big sponsors, all that sort of stuff. They're obviously yeah. doing something really well. Mm-hmm. And then, and sort of from a Liverpool point of view, someone that we work with a lot as well, the Anfield Rap, they've got a great relationship and because it's good to do something really good and unique and people want to listen to it. So, yeah, sort of if you've got that niche, then, yeah, that's what you've got to do, really. So I just wanted to touch on um, the great run that you had in Europe last season. You know, you eventually get knocked out by, in the quarters by the eventual winners, Sevilla. What was that like as a fan? Because, you know, only a couple of seasons before, you were playing in the championships. That must have been great for yourselves to go on that journey. Yeah, 100%. And I think that sort of the whole ride that we've had since Nuno's come to the club and Fosen have taken over, everything they've promised, they've delivered. And, um, you know, you, it can go so wrong. You see how many, how, you know, it was bad at Leeds for a long time where owner, 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 we'll get you back, we'll get you back. And like you hear all this stuff and eventually it f- sort of falls on deaf ears. Um, and before, obviously, Fosen took over, we had Steve Morgan was the owner. He was a massive Liverpool fan. Um, made no sort of um, secret of that. He wanted to buy Liverpool. I just don't think he had the money to do it. Um, but he just wanted to get into football. So Steve Morgan started running it as... Well, we went from Jack Haywood, who was you know, lived and breathed Wolves, put all his money into Wolves and, you know, fantastic man and, you know, God rest his soul, you know, he'd done brilliant, you know, everything for the city. He, he was he was a real, he's an icon with Wolves fans. Steve Morgan took it on and he was a football fan, yes, but he wasn't a Wolves fan and it was about the money. It was about turning the profit. It was, so we are in the championship for a long time under that regime and we never kicked on because it was, we get a great team you know, we had, we had a good team where we nearly went up when we come back up from sort of League One. And we had Benica Fobi, Bakri Sacco, Niradiko, and it was right. Let's sell a Fobi now. He went to Bournemouth. Let's sell a Sacco. Went to Palace, and it was sort of like just asset stripping. So with that sort of owner mentality, you're never gonna progress. Um, so actually seeing that sort of you know Fosner come in and um, said. You know, we want to win the Premier League in 10 years. We've got all this money. We're going to bring in this manager. And the first manager brought in Zenga, he didn't really cut it. And then we had Lambert for like four or five months. He was obviously he was managing when we knocked you out the cup <laughs> that season. Um, but then he got rid of him. And then it was, oh, we're bringing in a Portuguese manager. You never, you know, this is the man for it. And you're like, well, you said that about Zenga and he didn't do it. Same um, but then sort of since, you know, since Nuno's been at the club, it's just been pinch me moments, to be honest with you, all the time. And sort of the great thing about it is actually going toe to toe with with the the giants in 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 the UK. Well, sorry, in England and abroad, because you know, sort of, I've grown up with Wolves being sort of a a good championship team. Even when being up in the Premier League twice in my lifetime, we've basically been there to survive. And you sort of seeing you know, it's going away or even at home, we'd be playing 5-4-1, 4-5-1 and you just knew we were just, it was just boring to watch. Yeah. We're actually now sort of, we've got all these exciting players in, we've got a whole heap of talent. Um, I know people are saying about, you know, they're all Portuguese, this, Portuguese, that, etc. But I sort of said on the, the latest podcast, you know, if you're, if you're a good fisherman, you fish in the right ponds. So, you know, Nuno, Nuno knows these players, the coaching staff know these players, and they know that they're, they're, you know, they know what the, the strengths and the limitations. And actually, having these players and this culture we've got at the club, um, it's real, you know, it's like I say, sort of watching them week in, week out and being on the pitch. Wolves are now as a club, it's just we go into every game thinking we can win, we can win. Man City on Monday, um, just gone. We beat them twice last season. I, I fully, I didn't expect us to win. They're a fantastic team, but going into the game thinking, you know what, we right. can beat them. Yeah, like Liverpool last season. I know you beat us twice, but we'd probably give you the two hardest games you had. Games of the season, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so you know what I mean. Sort of that. That that's what's exciting now. It's we're not there to exist. We're there to try and compete. 
yeah, compete muscle in and sort of Fosen has like say Fosen said they want to win the Premier League in ten years. This was like three years ago. Like I'd you know, you'd be daft to back or bet against Wolves not doing that. And I know it's gonna be extremely hard and may seem a very sort of uh you know, fans you know, different fans from different groups like laughing at that comment, but don't bet against us, you know, sort of Nuno signed up for another three years now. The project's there. We're spending money. Uh, I'm not saying we are going to win it, but I think we'll be. I think we'll definitely finish in the top four within the next sort of three, four seasons. Hundred percent. Yeah, I think Wolves aren't seen as this this yo-yo club anymore. They're seen as a real, no. and it's a hard place to go. But it's also on the flip side, when they come to your place, you know they're going to play. You know they're not going to just sit back. They are going to play footy. They're going to try and win games. So you know with the Europe run. It must be great for you as a fan. You know, you're not just doing Millwall all the way, but you're having like Olympiacos and that coming. You know, that must yeah. be great for you. Yeah, and I think that that was sort of the that was sort of the, I suppose the disappointing thing of COVID, amongst other things, was it sort of stripped us of that Olympiacos away yeah. trip just because of, you know, what their fan the fans are like fanatics and sort of we we experienced it with Besiktas because they were in our group and um, we. By the time they played us in the last group game, they were already knocked out. But they still brought fan like they brought thousands over, and it was still like yeah, yeah. you're you thinking shit. We're in Europe here. Like, yeah. back, this is it. Like, you know what I mean? This is like a proper European game. Because before that, in the qualifiers and stuff, you know, you sort of play. You know, well, we played Crusaders, and we played a team from Armenia, and Crusaders brought a few fans over. But you expected just to steamroll them, sort of thing, and then. The team from Armenia, I think they brought probably not four, five fans. Yeah. Um, but so sort of actually qualifying and getting through to it, we were quite fortunate to have sort of Besiktas, who are obviously a big team. Braga sold out. And also we had Slovan Bratislava who sold out. So, yeah, I mean, it would have been amazing to have been at Molyneux when obviously we beat Olympiacos to go through into the sort of the knockout tournament, whatever you want to call it in yeah. terms of whatever it was back, you know, in Germany to finish it all off. But, um, yeah, to, even just to experience that for a Wolves fan, sort of, it hasn't happened in my, you know, that certainly happened, happened in my lifetime. And um, that happened for about 30, 40 years. I think it was 40 years at Molyneux. So to have those sort of nights back, the big thing about that is, I know we're not there this year, but it, it didn't feel like it was a one-off. You sort of, Burnley have done it, Southampton, Stoke, when they were in the Premier League. And it was sort of, yeah, they had the season and it never happened again. Like I think I genuinely think that we'll be back Consistent. and we'll back and go and yeah, and by all means, you know, sort of we end up losing to the eventual winners in Sevilla. And I don't really we didn't really show up on on the night really and the, it was the right result. Um the, you know, the biggest one then it was definitely the right result on the on the day. Um but if Jimenez would have took his penalty after, you know, sort of five, ten minutes, it'd give us something to hold on to and it, could, it would have been a different, completely different game. So it was a sort of a what if moment, but there was no disgrace losing to Sevilla who end up going on to win it. So, you know, we've got to a quarter final in our first European um run in forty years. You can't you can't really knock that or fault it. So you just want to be back as soon as possible. It's like you say, the club's got such a uh, such a motivation to, you know, push into the top six, top four. Now, what do you personally feel like is needs to be the next step to do that? <clears throat> I think it's um so many teams sure. come along like like and they, they do a little push. I remember Villa doing it, Everton have done it, and it's yeah. like, yeah, we push. And then you, when you know it's not going to happen, you start selling players, and then you start falling. You, yeah, so what would you know in an ideal world? What would you personally see as being that next that thing that pushes you into the top six, top four? I think it's sort of what we've seen, what we've seen already, and it's obviously to sort of a lesser extent, but you can see it sort of, I think to get to that stage, you've got to be ruthless and you can't be, um, fans are always going to love players that have been on that journey and you've seen, but ultimately you can't get attached to the cycle of players you've got. Yeah. So when we come up into the Premier League, um, we had left back um, or left wing back, should I say, Barry Douglas, who we sold to Leeds as soon as we come up and in the championship, he'd got about, 12 assists but the reality of it is he couldn't defend to save his life yeah. but he got sold and it was absolute outrage and then we sell Douglas and the fans are like what's going on here then we go and get Johnny 
uh, who's then a Spanish international. And it's like, right, there we go. And sort of now with Doherty, sort of Wolves fan, he, he, he splits Wolves fans' opinions because of defensively, he probably isn't at it, but his goal output and assist output My is goal. like an FPL player's dream sort of thing. But when Spurs came in and bought him, the there wasn't many Wolves fans who were disappointed um, because we've seen him in a back four under Jacket, under Lambert, under all that. And you think, he ain't good enough. So Mourinho buying him is really strange for me. But obviously now, Doherty's gone. We've got Semedo. And like, I know I know Liverpool have just bought Jota. Um, and he, he, I think he'll be a fantastic player for you just because of his versatility in front that, around that front three. Yeah. But everything that's happened so far, right? we're selling Jota. Someone's coming in is sort of my mentality. And I think that that's sort of to become sort of a top team and that you've got to be consistent. You've got to be ruthless. And yeah, you're going to have your favourites as fans, but the manager and the club can't have the favourites because if it's the right time for them to go, they've got to go. And um, I mean, dare I say it, there might be a time where sort of Connor Cody, that sort of, you know, like Connor Cody is that now with, you know, sort of that last piece of he's been with us all that way and his meteoric rise has been superb. I don't think we'll ever sell him. And I think that I'd, I think it'd be heartbreaking for Wolves fans to sell him just because of he's everything that we're about. Like he's a good talker, he's a fantastic captain, loves the club. I know he's obviously a massive red as well. And I'm sure that some Liverpool fans wouldn't mind having him just because of that scouse, yeah. you know, almost that Jamie Carragher mold for you. Um, but if he was to go, I think it would truly break hearts. But if he went, it'd be because Nuno and Fosen have got a plan to go, right, we're going to get this person in. That sort of, that's what I think he's, that, that, is the, that is the step. As long as you're ruthless and aggressive with what you're doing and you've got that plan, that's what I mean. That's why I'm genuinely thinking that we will break the top four at some point. It's going to be even harder to stay there, but there's no way that, there's no way that anyone can say confidently that we won't get top four with how the rise that we've done so far. So, yeah, I think as long as you're being ruthless with it, yeah, I, I, I genuinely think we'll be successful for a few years to come still, yeah. Yeah, it seems like the people behind the scenes really have got a plan of when this player goes, we're going to bring a like-for-like like player in. You know, it's not a step down. It might not necessarily be a step up. <coughs> step, you know, it's a sideways step and they'll be eventually a better player. So, no, I, I think there's definitely a good chance that you, that you boys could do that. Another thing that I want to touch on, is the, the light show that you have at Molyneux now before your games. So I know other clubs have got it. Start, I think Spurs have started to implement it into their yeah. new ground. Do you feel that adds to the atmosphere as a fan? It can do, yeah. And I think that probably it probably adds to it for an away fan more than the home fans. And what I mean by that is, obviously, you get used to it when you see it every, every other Saturday. Um, but it can proper get you know pro- can proper get you up for it. I mean, we did have fireworks before that, but we've had two accidents now where we've it's hit odd. fans. That, yeah, so uh, they've long gone, mate. To be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now that with the light show and stuff, it's. Um, I mean, the first time it happened, I think, if I'm not mistaken, would have been it might have been Liverpool at home. You know. In I think it was. I think it was a it, Friday night. Yeah, it was. That it was you. You come and beat us two 0 I think. But that was the first time we had this because it was like right. We're having. A, we had a live DJ there actually as well. And it was like right. Get to the ground early. We've got this light show. We've got this DJ, and you're like, this ain't football. Yeah, but then like actually the DJ started and the light started going. You're thinking, wow, this is like this is incredible. Mm. Absolutely, you know. And but football now has now become more of a. It's more of a business now. There's no, there's no taking away from it. And people, when they buy match tickets, they want value for money. So they don't just want to watch the football. They want, they want the experience of right. I've had a good evening, a good day. Insane. I've been to the club shop. I've done this. I've, I've been in the, I've been in the. Uh, what, I'm trying to think what they call it now. Like, sort of like the, the, the village. Like I know they've got them at Anfield. Like the way you go in and have your drinks, and they've got like a music and all that. They want that experience now. Yeah. Whether that's good or bad for the game, I know that sort of Wolves fans now, and I know Liverpool are already there, where sort of Liverpool now being that big worldwide that you get to Anfield and sometimes it feels like it's uh, hospitality tickets, it's tourists, it's all this, and it sort of takes away from the game. And I think that 
that's the fear for Wolves fans that we are still that traditional club and it's feast and famine ultimately if you're a big club uh, sorry if you're a winning team you get more exposure you get more fans and naturally it's going to happen but you can't have one without the other and I sort of feel like a bit of a hypocrite because I'm a, I'm a big NFL fan as well so actually I go to Wembley every year to watch the NFL like Minnesota Vikings fan so I'll go once a year with a group of mates but again you can't say I want that to be in London every year but then I don't want people yeah. who aren't proper Wolves fans not coming to Marlon you it, you can't do it so oh, yeah. Um, yeah it's that sort of thing really for me so at Marlon you where the away fans are it seems to be a lower I don't know what the stand is but it's a lower tier and it's spread, yeah. spread out all the away fans I know a lot of people that have done it and said it's really hard to make an atmosphere do you think there's you know there's some some theory behind that is someone thought you know if we spread out all the fans across it's going to be hard for them to make an atmosphere yeah, oh, most definitely. <clears throat> we want it to be horrible. There's no two ways about it. Oh, and um, actually, that. yeah, so sort of, sort of, I've spoke to away fans and they're like, you just can't get an atmosphere there at all. And um, it's because it's that spread. It's literally the full length of the pitch. It's spread across. And the original plan was we just built the an extension on the North Bank, which is, if you're watching it on the telly, the, the, the stand beyond the gold on the left, we'd done like another tier on there, made it like modern. And the plan was that we were actually going to put away fans in the co- lot in the corner, and we did that for a little bit of time. And um, away teams started; it just seemed like away teams were winning, and I don't know why. But they've then reverted back to no, go back down there. And then since then, other than when it's like the FA Cup or when you've got to give 20 twenty twenty five percent or whatever it is, they yeah. get the that side and the bottom. It's just the bottom for league games and. Um, yeah, sort of. You feel like so you got the so the stand is um, the Steve Ball stand. It was the old John Ireland stand. So we've got the away fans across the bottom there. You have got the upper Steve Ball, which is all Wolves fans. Above the away fans, you've got boxes, which is all Wolves fans. And then you've got the South Bank to if you're watching on the telly to your right hand side, which is the notorious singing side of it all. It's it's really intimidating, and um, I, I, there's a lot of fans who I've spoken to and um, maybe I'm a bit biased but a lot of people who think that Wolves is like sort of the best home atmosphere in the Premier League at the minute and most certainly when you get us on a good day um, and the right atmosphere sort of under floodlights sort of like the famous Anfield for European nights that sort of stuff like you do feel like the fans actually make you feel like we make a massive difference to that and the biggest one of that was sort of two years ago when we beat Man United in the quarterfinal of the FA Cup at Molyneux like the atmosphere there was just, it was just, you just like, like from minute one, you just felt, yeah, it just felt like we were going to win the game. They had the better team. You just knew we were going to win the game. And it was sort of that atmosphere. So, yeah, Molyneux's not a nice place for away fans. <laughs> <laughs> so, finally, the podcast is centered around going to the match. So, of every podcast we're doing, I want to end by asking, what are your top three favorite matches you've been to? So, it doesn't have to be based on the 90 minutes itself, but it was something that happened during the day or for whatever reason. Um, <clears throat> so that one that I've just mentioned, the FA Cup game, um, for me, that was sort of, I think that's the best game I've ever been to in terms of just, so I think it's, well, it's definitely the closest I've come to actually just crying at football game, genuinely just crying, uh, sort of the raw emotion of it. And Jota, when he scored the second goal, like it's the one video that comes up on the Twitter timeline every now and again where I can just watch it. Because it's just the fan noise, and it's like a squeal. It's just, and you can just feel it again. Like you sort of feel when that's it. You like you knew we knew then we were going to like we haven't been in the Premier League or been a good team for a very long time, but we haven't been to Wembley for a very long time. And again, in my life, that was the first time we've been to Wembley in my lifetime in like twenty nine years. So the chance to go, I know eventually we lost to Watford, but that. You know, less said that about that, the better. Um, but actually, just going to it was just for Wolves. It's such a big, iconic moment and such a big game. So that's definitely one for me. Um, another one would have been sort of, which again we touched on already, would have been where we'd beat Liverpool Anfield a couple of years ago as well. Um, I saw. I know we exchanged some messages before we'd done this podcast, but I was actually in the cop with my dad. Yeah. So. Um, before the game, I'd met up with a few of my mates in the, um, the Anfield Village and um, having a few drinks with them. Obviously, 
there was Wolves fans, Liverpool fans, you know, was, there's no rivalry there. It's quite friendly, that sort of yeah. stuff. And um, we're all just drinking together and stuff. And um, obviously went to the cop because we're both um, cup members for the FA Cup. And um, I went with no expectations. We weren't, a, we weren't a good team at that point. Like I, I had no expectation. And I think the Liverpool were playing Firmino, Origi, Gomez, Carius was in goal. <laughs> Less said about that, the better. Um, but obviously, sort of, we scored after about a minute, I think. Um, Richard Stearman scored in front of the cop. And uh, it was like, I just sat there. I was like, right, okay. Like, just still thinking, Ed, we're going to lose this 4 1, 5 1, whatever. So it was sort of, that was okay. And um, then we got a second one about 20 minutes later. Vyman scored. And literally, I've jumped up out of my seat. And I've gone, get in there. And then people are looking around like, what's going on? And my dad's saying, oh, no, uh, my dad's trying to like say, nah, 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 Liverpool fan, Liverpool fan. But my dad's saying it with the thickest, he's got a thicker black country accent than me. They're like, there's two Wolves fans here. They're like, literally the whole game then, it was just like, nah. So in terms of experience, it was very hostile. We got a frosty reception from the Liverpool fans in the cop that day. <laughs> um, <laughs> and sort of, I think sort of um, a third one for me, um, would have been and unfortunately I wasn't actually at the game um, but I'm happy to say it was definitely in my top three moments was when um, we got promoted in 2003 at Cardiff so the day of the game and I didn't know this till a few years later my mum actually called up the ticket office and about 20 had been returned on the day and she said to my dad it's 20 tickets here do you want to take him and my dad was like I ain't driving to Cardiff I was like and I only found out about that probably a few years ago. I was like, literally, Dad, you ca- like, I was so annoyed. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> um, but in terms of a game, that was the first time we'd been in the Premier League. We beat Sheffield United 3-0. Sort of what I was saying there about Sir Jack Haywood previously being the owner, being a Wolves fan. He put all this money into the club. I mean, in sort of the late 80s, early 90s, we were in Div 4. Like, we were close to going out of business. And... Um, the Premier League, whether you like it or not, is that promised land of that's where the money is. If you don't, if you're not in the Premier League, some people you don't exist. Yeah. And um, obviously, growing up watching Match of the Day, watching Super Sunday, all that sort of stuff, um, Wolves were never obviously on there. But actually, going and winning that game three 0 it meant so much to me. Thinking right, I think one of the first things I thought about was right, we're going to be on FIFA now. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, so in terms of I was, I would have been 11, about 11, 12 at that time. But I remember just that day, how, how it felt. And then we end up going into driving into the city centre and like the flags. And it was just like a massive party in Wolverhampton. And it's not the nicest places to be, uh, but it's always going to be home. And sort of seeing the, the joy and jubilation on people's faces, although I wasn't at the game, sort of seeing it on the TV. Rolling. Hearing about the stories, going into the town centre afterwards, it was just like you fit. You know what I mean? It's sort of this yeah. is big, massive, monumental. For the uh, well. Yeah, exactly that. So you know, sort of that. That for me is always going to have a. That would be that would be number one if I was actually at Cardiff, but because of my dad, I wasn't. So there you go. We'll have to sit with settle with the Man United Cup game. Not a bad one. I don't think there's a better way to talk about uh, <laughs> the beating United. So. Thank you very much for coming on, mate. I really appreciate you giving up your time and coming on. Yeah, no, I appreciate, you know, talking to you. And um, I know it's sort of a new podcast and I had listened to sort of the James Pierce episode. Um, and yeah, I think it's a, you know, cracking podcast and I wish you all the best with it, mate. Oh, thank you very much, mate. I really appreciate that. Yeah. If you haven't already, please subscribe, follow and share. And of course, leave a five-star rating. <laughs>